Welcome back to the next episode of the Life Sciences Professional Podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce my guest, Petter Henson, and he has been in the Fortune 500 organizations as well as small and startup companies. He's going to share with you what that is like to transition from very large corporations to being with small and even startup organizations and what it takes to really make that transition and how different it is to work for companies when you have all the resources to absolutely none and how to be successful in helping those companies grow. Please welcome me to um, inviting Petter to our next podcast and I think you'll really enjoy what he has to say. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi Petter, how are you? Doing great. How are you, Linda? Yeah, good. Thanks so much for joining us on the Life Sciences Professional Podcast. I'm excited to have you as a guest, as I know our listeners will be uh, really interested to hear what you have to say. But before we get started, if you don't mind just doing a brief introduction about yourself, professionally, personally, whatever you're willing to share, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on, Linda. Um, So I think uh, starting off, I began my career back in Sweden, uh, where I grew up, and shortly after high school, I got the opportunity to join a uh, cardiac uh, surgery organization in manufacturing, which took me on a bit of a roller coaster ride and uh, had the opportunity to kind of become an expat uh, within a few years of joining that organization. So I actually jumped at the opportunity to move to Canada um, and basically start uh, a service organization for that business and uh, gradually kind of moved into various roles through the years. And I spent a good 10 years of my career with that organization in total, doing everything from operations to service management, to sales, commercialization, product management, you name it. Um, And then that kind of led me into um, more of a vendor agnostic opportunity with a Fortune 500 company uh, named Aramark and kind of looking after their um, uh, medical device servicing business uh, and a couple of their key accounts and turnaround situations in Canada for a number of years. And um, during that time, I also decided to go back and do my executive MBA with Richard Ivey School of Business out of London, Ontario, um, which was another exciting opportunity and challenge to do that in parallel to working, but it was well worth it. And that kind of propelled me into a great opportunity with Philips Health System later on, uh, kind of coming in to help them um, take a hard look at what was working, what wasn't working, and figuring out better approaches for driving aftermarket uh, revenue uh, after the uh, capital equipment sales were happening and so on. And uh, then in 2020, I decided to take a year off and uh, spend it with my son who was in his last year of leukemia treatment. And once I kind of felt, okay, it's time to get back in and find something exciting, I actually decided to kind of go back to the roots a little bit and and looked at more of a startup environment and taken on a couple of startups in the last couple of years and really the entrepreneurial side of uh, that comes with that. So, which has been exciting opportunity in the last couple of years. And besides that, I've got a family here now in Canada. I moved without a family and now I've established a little bit more of a home here and uh, I've got a son that's six years old. We've got two dogs, and uh, that takes up most of my time these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't I know it? I know what that's yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you, you look at your career journey and all the experiences you had, you know, from customer service, logistics, operations, sales, marketing, product management, you've really pretty much touched every area within a business that's even possible. And, you know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing candidates in our business and individuals are looking at going from individual contributor or trying to move up the corporate ladder and wondering how to do it in terms of if you ever want to become a GM or, you know, really oversee an organization, what do they need to do? Well, you've done it, right? (laughs) So if you're going to run an organization or help a startup and really help them understand how do you take a business and be able to grow it, to commercialize a product or be able to expand uh, the business. Do you think all of those experiences have really over the 20 plus years that you've worked, right? And developed um, those um, skill sets as well as your MBA, right? Obviously yep. your executive MBA has contributed to your knowledge and skill set to work with the uh, startups and SMEs. Do you think that that has Um, really made you expert at being able to do that that's really helped you can you maybe expand on that did you need all that 
or um, could you have done it without having all those skill sets? Yeah, so I think it's it's an interesting uh, point because I have intentionally with my career kind of jumped at opportunities that come up, whether it's in operations, whether it's in sales, it doesn't really matter. I, I saw the opportunity to kind of broaden my skill set, broaden my understanding of, of businesses, different product lines, different ways of doing business and also different markets. So looking at Canada, the US, looking at Europe, and, and there's always things you can learn from it. So I think it's a matter of having the mindset that you've never learned everything and you're never going to be an expert at anything. Um, and it kind of having the ability to put the pieces together, I think is what to me is critical when you're really getting into the more leadership roles, the general management positions, those type of things where it's figuring out how does individuals work and that you can maximize their ability to take the business to the next level and recognizing that everybody is different. And I think having that sort of cross-functional view on things also help you understand what some of the challenges are in other areas. So do you have to be that broad? Not necessarily, but I think it really helps and it gives you a much broader perspective on on business and how to actually make things successful and, and being able to put those pieces together. And and that's part of why I decided to do my executive MBA with Richard Ivey as well was because they're, they were not necessarily focused on one particular functional discipline. It was very broad and it was really looking at everything from entrepreneurial up to uh, in-depth financing and, and how do you put all those pieces together and really challenge your mindset uh, to make that, to drive that success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll go into an organization, they'll ask me to help to figure out, you know, what's not working. It could be around their talent, it could be around their sales skills, their leadership skills. And a lot of times what I see because I'm 40, I'm, when I go in, I'm 40,000 feet above looking down and you and I've yeah. joked about that a little bit, right? <laughs> because there's no biases there. So we can really exactly. very clearly see what's missing, what's working and what's a, sort of a cog in the wheel and what might be missing. And often it's either the right people, the systems or the process, right? And we'll talk about that in more detail. And, um, you know, what did, what advantages do you think large organizations have over, say, SMEs? What are sort of those key advantages that you, you see they have that maybe SMEs don't have? Yeah, so I think there's a few aspects. And, and it's certainly, obviously, from a career perspective and a personal perspective, they, they tend to be a little bit more financial gain up front. Uh, they're more established. They're a little bit more structured. They have different band levels and all that. So I think financially, you may see some better benefit up front. But really, as an organization, the true benefit is that they've also tried a lot of things over the years. And, and you get a chance to kind of learn from some of their mistakes without having to do them yourself. And, and I think it's figuring out what those big machines are able to do and, and where they drive efficiency. And then as you kind of move into the smaller organizations is then figuring out what pieces of that big puzzle can you correlate and bring back over and really then drive efficiency. And it's one of those where I've heard so many leaders talk about, well, we have a playbook and we just replicate that in every organization we go into. But I find a lot of times every organization is different, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's okay to have maybe a framework of how you operate, but having a set playbook that you expect to work in every organization, I, I think is a big mistake. And that's where learning from large, different organizational sizes, different operational functions within the organizations really help you put those pieces together to say in this environment here's what really is going to be impactful and then as the organization grows then you start adding things to that and and especially i think the biggest difference from the large fortune 500 to the small ones is really in the small ones you need to be a lot more focused on the minimal viable product approach and really be able to experiment to be agile and flexible with what you're doing and not say, well, we have five years to test this out. It's really, what do you do in the next quarter approach, which mm -hmm. the big companies don't typically do because it takes them a year to make decisions. So that, that's typically the biggest difference and why uh, I think if you like structure, if you like sort of a more standardized approach, the big organizations are definitely your cup of tea, um, but they also come with that limitation that if you want to broaden that, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to move the needle within those organizations. Right. Yeah, I used to say when I worked for a large organization, we were, as a leader, we were having meetings about meetings. And really what I was saying was, you know, it was really making 
decisions and, and things took a lot longer where I'd yeah. come from an entrepreneurial organization that we move lightning fast. Exactly. And if something wasn't working, why not? What, what could we do? But it's interesting. I just um, was working with an organization that had a leadership um, role that was open and they were looking for somebody and we just placed a candidate that had been in, in a SME, a smaller organization, yep. that this individual had done everything in that organization, started young, basically touched every aspect of the business, yep. was a real dynamo, great personality, a, a strong leader, great um, and manager that was ready to move to a, a large organization. Yep. And the reason that she was looking for a large organization was to have the opportunity to work with other individuals, to be, yeah. you know, challenged. Um, she didn't have others to lean on. She didn't, in yeah. the current organization she's with, you know, didn't have the marketing infrastructure, didn't have the QA department, didn't have the finance department with all that knowledge that she could then start to develop more in her career. So yeah. she had hit that ceiling, right? Of complexity and, and opportunity to develop herself. So yeah. this is a great opportunity for her to go to an organization where she will now move to the next level within her career and yeah. be able to um, you know, continue to develop, not only just personally within the next career move, but from a skill um, exactly. perspective, right? Knowledge perspective. So she's really looking yeah. forward to that. And they've gotten somebody who's self-motivated, who learns quickly, very adaptable, um, yeah. very bright individual, right? And uh, driven and, and a top performer, not somebody who's just, you know, going to stick within her lane. She goes outside of that. So, yeah. you know, that's where, you know, in a large organization often takes a long time for individuals to move from one role to the next. Exactly. unless they've had that happen in their previous yeah. roles before right so yeah and and in large organizations too i think that you know they have from attracting talent perspective they have an advantage because they have a brand a culture they're well known um so yeah. sometimes they can hire much more easily than a smaller startup right they you yeah. know they don't have that brand or culture to be able to attract people, but they also, you know, money is the issue too, right? Yeah. So, you know, what do you think are the five challenges that small organizations or startups have or that leaders encounter? What are things that you've experienced that maybe there's more than five, but <laughs> I'm sure there is, yeah. but don't, five that maybe stand out to you. So I think uh, th there's uh, certainly three in around five that really stand out. Number one, I think it's just sort of going into a small organization, going into a venture, or even a, a pure startup from scratch is is uh, making sure that you don't go in with too many assumptions, right? It, it's really going in with a very open mind and an, an exploratory mindset to say, okay, you know what? We're starting this. We have some great ideas. We're trying to do all these things, but you know what? We don't know everything. And I think that's that's absolutely key because far too many uh, leaders and, and organizations make that assumption that what we have, everybody's going to want to buy. Mm -hmm. But until you yeah. actually dig in and you start doing your market research and assess everything, assess what customers are willing to buy, it's hard to say, okay, this is really something you can commercialize properly versus just, okay, it's fun to have and you're going to have maybe 100 customers that buy it in a year, but that's not going to be sustainable. So I think it, it, that would be the number one piece. And I think especially people that have had success in the past and tend to think, okay, well, we have something great. We assume everybody's going to love it. And that's it. Um, that's a that's a very dangerous piece to dangerous mindset to walk in with. I think the other is when you think about what you need to be successful, a lot of people tend to be more on the perfectionist side and overthink things. And all of a sudden you're sitting there six months later, not having really done anything different and really coming into the smaller organizations. It's like, let's focus on the smaller pieces where we can move things along. We can action things, we can make decisions, we can test it out and we can see if it's having an impact. 
And as you learn what works and what doesn't work, it's very similar to, to marketing. It's like we can have the best idea in the world. It doesn't mean that it resonates with people. So you got to experiment. You got to have test groups and subjects that kind of look at it and say, yeah, this makes sense to us. And the business side is exactly the same until you figure out what works from a scalability perspective and how to sell it, the price points, all these things. Um, you have to kind of play that agile sort of um, iterative game of how do we test things? And how do we do it in a cost-effective, short-term perspective to say this works, the rest we can discard. Um, that would be number two. The, the third is really looking at talent and, and acquiring people that can help you make a difference. Um, obviously, as a smaller organization, you're not going to have the same vast resources that a large organization does, but it also allows you to be more nimble. So it allows you flexibility and agility that you otherwise wouldn't have, but it only does that if you have the right individuals. So if you have driven people that want that are willing to roll up their sleeves, that are willing to kind of get in and say, you know what, I don't know this area, but we need help. Let's just figure it out. As opposed to saying, well, I'm staying in my swim lane and that's all I'm doing. If you can get those driven, more entrepreneurial mindsets in the organization, then you'll have a quick, quick win and you can drive the business forward. And then you'll start to build those people that you can rely on, that you can delegate to, and you can kind of hand things off and, you know, they're going to be taken care of without having to become a micromanager and really pay attention to everything in the organization. Because as, as you're building and you're figuring out the, the smaller organizations, there's so many things going on. There's no way that you can touch everything and you shouldn't be, you should, you should have the right team in place to, to drive that success for you as well. So I, I think those would be the, the, yeah. the number the, the absolute top three for smaller organizations. And, and, and again, not being afraid to take opportunities, right. And, and finding that balance between opportunistic behavior and strategic, uh, and, and looking to the future to say, where do we want to be in five years? And it's okay to try things along the way. But don't forget about what you're trying to drive to from a bigger picture perspective either. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, a lot of times too, it's the, it's not setting up. I find in the beginning, some of the systems and processes, and then they grow to a certain level. So how do you take yeah. your company from five to 20 to 50? So just putting some simple systems and processes in place right exactly. in the get go, because yeah. once you start to get momentum, it's hard to go backwards, right? Yeah. It so, is. you know, I find some clients that will come to us about hiring and they're at that point where, OK, we're ready to scale and they don't have the tools and resources for these people to be successful. They don't it, simple things like, you know, onboarding, you know, the HR processes and they don't have to have a lot. But yeah. the other thing, too, is, you know, thinking about because some of them have come from corporate and then they've spun off and become entrepreneurial. Yeah. So they still think corporate and that they have to hire for certain people. So they'll have a five people and an HR. We don't need yeah. that. Right. <laughs> so, you know, trying to coach them around, you know, you can outsource that. Yeah, there's exactly. certain things that you can outsource. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, even having um you know, CEOs or, you know, like man leadership that you don't have to have them full time. You don't need marketing full time. You don't need social media marketing full time or an assistant exactly. full time. There's so many different things that they can do um, in terms of being able to scale and grow without putting headcount or people or tools in that are expensive exactly. that, um, you know, you can manage your growth much more affordable than you know, large organizations too. And I think sometimes it's it's understanding what resources and nowadays with technology, it's so easy, right? You yeah. can have virtual assistants, you can have virtual marketing, you can, you know, it's just that goes on and on and on to help companies do that. <laughs> but I think your comment, I, uh, I love your comment in terms of don't wait for things to be perfect. Just go out and find out, you know, what it, your market is, going to tolerate, you know, in terms of who needs your product, what should your price point be? Who are your competitors? Like just go yep. out and figure it out. Exactly. We worked um, with a company in the States robotic uh, organization and um, they scaled up their team way before they probably mm -hmm. should have. And they were going to market in terms of areas that really weren't ready for them. And I, and I, to your point, I don't think they did the market research that they should have. Uh, to be prepared and ready 
for yeah. uh, their product. And, um, you know, your, your investors, you can only go to investors so many times, right? That all of a sudden you don't have that financial um, support that you need. And that's the other thing I, you know, that is important. They need the funding. So, you know, the team and attracting people, having the funding you need to grow, um, you know, the business model and processes and timing. Uh, yeah. to your point right so those are some of the things that had popped into my head when i was um thinking about that uh, question for you as well right in terms of yeah. what what's important and and how have you found working for different organizations in terms of large or you know fortune 500 to small you know how have you found making those transitions did it, were you able to do it quickly did you know what what was that like for you yeah, so I think for, for me personally, it's never been a challenge. I think it's, it's again, if you go in with an open mindset that uh, there's opportunity, that yes, you're going to have new people, people reporting to you, people you report into, um, but just go in with a mindset and learn, listen, and then you um, kind of find your path from there. I think that's the key is just don't assume anything when you go in. Uh, you can learn a lot through interviews, but things are always different once you're on the inside. Whether yeah. it's large organizations or small, doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's um, right. Yeah. So just go in and expect that. And, and as yeah. much as in some cases you may look at it and say, you know what, I can't stand this organization. It's too much political, too much red tape, blah, blah, blah. No organization is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So just recognizing that right off the bat and just say, you know what, I'm going to go in and make the best of the situation. And I see the opportunity and that's where the focus should be. And then the rest you can you can work with. And in absolute worst case, if you get into an organization and it really isn't your cup of tea, there's nothing wrong in that. It just might not have been the right fit that you thought was there. And then you just look around, and you move around, move on. So that's right. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think the, the the one thing I always look at is like the only constant in life is change, right? And and that's the mindset you got to have is don't be afraid to change. And if it's basically if you don't if you're not happy with it, then you have the choice to change. You don't have to put up with it. That's right. And that's, you know, I think um, that is fantastic to say that, right? Because I see so many people that I'm talking to and they have stayed in a role. And, you know, I always try to coach candidates or even employers for that matter, is that you don't want to get to a situation that you're running away from something. You should always be running to something. Exactly. And, you know, you've probably heard the saying, you know, do what you love and money will follow, right? Yep. And I love what I do. I've been doing it for 22 years. So obviously, <laughs> right, I really like it a lot. But there are so many different things I do in my day yeah. and interaction with different people. So my passion is trying to help companies hire great people and great individuals get into the right role. And to your point, if you're not happy, you know, either figure out what's making you not happy, yep. right? Because happiness comes from within. There's no question about that. But then, you know, you can correct that. There's nothing, it's not a failure. It's, it's, you've identified what makes you happy and what doesn't make you happy. So, exactly. you know, try something different. There's lots of opportunities up there. There's lots of different yep. things that make you happy. I learned very quickly. I do not like bureaucracy. <laughs> I love to be creative. I love to change, yep. do different things all the time. Right. So once yep. you figure yourself out, you know the rest is history right it's exactly it's awesome <laughs> yeah. so you know it, it's really um important so yeah. w when you think of company culture how important do you think that is um in terms of establishing that and making sure especially with small um and startup organizations that that gets established very quickly yeah. uh in order to be successful i mean product um, or service, whatever an organization is um, they're providing to their market. How important do you think that is to really get a handle on that right in the get go? So I, I think it's um, from a startup perspective, I think in the initial phases is less important because you're typically such a small team that it's maybe a handful of people that's involved and engaged that at that point you're you're working closely enough that if it's not working, you're going to be swapping pieces out anyway uh, in, in order to maximize the outcomes for the business. But as you kind of grow beyond the, the point of like five individuals that are full time on the organization, then culture really starts to become much more critical. So I think it's important to recognize early on what culture you want to have so that you're building towards that. And then as you're scaling up and you're adding people onto the team, then it's naturally kind of just morphs into that without having to all of a sudden say, oh, well, we're starting from scratch and we're having to build 
culture because we now have six people on board. But it just naturally happens because you already have a, an idea of what you want it to be. So you're kind of acting in a way that starts to build on that from day one, but you're not intentionally like a lot of big organizations that are trying to figure out how do we build better culture. They tend to be a lot more structured and systematic in their approach. I don't think you need to be that extreme in a startup environment or a small organization. It should be a lot more natural. And then you naturally you start to weed out maybe the, the weaker uh, components in that organization or the weaker individuals and weaker pieces in how you operate as well. And you figure out what works and what doesn't. And then just naturally it should grow. And the influence from other team members should also be part of that culture piece to say, okay, it's not just one individual saying, this is what I want, but this is a team effort to build something that makes us as a team much, much greater. And have you seen in the smaller organizations where the culture is actually destructive to yeah. the progress of, of an organization? It's gotten yeah. to that point that, you know, they're not, the needle's not being moved because the culture just wasn't managed along the way and they start losing people and they're not getting the growth. Have you seen that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the, the, the biggest mistake there that kind of drives that, that negative cultural impact is when you have leaders that assume that everybody is the same, right? When, when you go in with a mindset that, okay, well, this is how I like it and you assume that everybody else in the organization should be thinking the same way, you're going to start to see people drop off because they just don't feel like they fit in. And then in my mind that you, you kind of lost the focus on culture because culture is bringing everybody together as right. opposed to trying to get everybody to fit into the same box. Right. And, you know, there's so many people, they get to a certain level in their careers, say 20, 25 years, and they're strong leaders or you know, strong competencies in their um, area of expertise, would you recommend, say they, they work in a Fortune 500 or, you know, medium-sized organization, would you recommend that they consider startups or SMEs? What, what would you say to individuals like that? I, I think so. I mean, if you're if you feel that you kind of hit, hit that sort of stagnant stage in your career, you're not maybe as motivated as you used to be. A startup environment or an SME environment tends to kind of reignite that spark because all of a sudden you get involved in so many different things in a very short amount of time. And it kind of allows you to kind of find your path again to say, OK, well, I either like that general approach or there's a different area I can now actually get into because there is no sort of set succession that there's five people ahead of me to get into that side of the business. So I think the startup and the SME environment definitely allows for that. And it really it, it allows you to go back to the roots of what is business and, and help move the needle in that regard. So definitely, I would suggest if unless all you're doing is working to retirement, then startup and SME is definitely a great environment to be in. And, and it moves so fast that you're, you're never going to be bored. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, when you think of the life sciences industry, the biggest growth area are startups, right? Yeah. Whether it be, you know, biotech or, or med tech or um, there's just so many companies that really yeah. need um, talent to join their organizations to help them. And they're looking. It's yeah. just a matter of, you know, some of them think, oh, you know, and I, I have a client uh, in the U.S. that seems to be very focused on, well, we want people that are experienced working with startups. And you know what? If all of them want startup experience, good luck, because they don't have yeah. enough, <laughs> enough to go around. So they really need to be looking at individuals that have the ability to pivot yeah. um, to that environment that maybe they've worked for some smaller organizations or they're very collaborative individuals or they've worked for large organizations that were not part of the large um, corporate uh, environment. Yeah. So they really have to think outside the box and, you know, work with probably, um, you know, executive recruiters that specialize and understand that environment. I think having a, a partner that can help them with that. but. You know, to your point, I think it's if, if you're somebody who's looking for a change and wants a new challenge, I think it's a great idea. I was just curious as to hear <laughs> perspective on that. So that's great. And, yeah. um, you know, one last question. If you're somebody that is looking and wants to research that industry, there's so many um, different ways. But is there what would you recommend? For someone that's curious and wants to learn more about startups or SMEs, where would they go? Where would they find out 
about companies or even just sort of um, industry as a whole? Any recommendations that you have for them? Uh, so I, I would say keep it simple and a lot of it and from my perspective, my experience goes back to net networking and, and just basically reach out to people, ask questions, learn. Um, I find especially startups because they're so new, they're not going to be as present. Um, like if you go on certain uh, standard um, uh, websites and databases, you'll find a lot of medical and, and life sciences organizations. But again, the startups don't necessarily reside there yet because they're still early on. They're still trying to figure out what they're doing, what their offering is and, and who's in the organization. So going back to just networking and, and as simple as LinkedIn and just reach out, just search for startups and, and people are putting more and more of those keywords in their either descriptions or their titles and so on. And you'll find a list of 100 people and just send an email, send a message out and ask. Can I get five minutes? Just I've got a couple of questions. I'm curious about how that environment is and, and just don't be afraid to ask and really become a, a salesperson at that point and say, I'm here to learn. I'm not selling you anything. I'm here to learn and see if this is something that's for me. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate your time. I know that uh, it's something that a lot of individuals are curious about and they you know, just the simple fact that you made such a great transition from Fortune 500 at two very large companies, you know, Philips yeah. and, um, you know, going to the smaller organizations, some people think, oh, there's no way I could never do yeah. it. You've done it very successfully. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, coming and uh, moving to Canada as well and very successfully doing that. I think both of those are um great lessons that uh, individuals can see that you've successfully done that. You know, I interview people all the time that are new to Canada. It doesn't matter where they come from. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they've maybe transitioned with their company and then there's been some change and now they're looking for, uh, they've been downsized or whatever from the company that they moved with and now they're looking for a new role. So yeah. I think that, you know, there's lots to be said about companies hiring and, you know, just keep networking and talking to new individuals all the time on LinkedIn for sure. Yeah. Or reaching out to recruiters like myself, which they do some. And uh, the other thing is, is not to be afraid to um, try different types of organizations. Don't always stick to the lane that you've been in, right? Exactly. <laughs> just try something new. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Be, be willing to experiment and just if an opportunity comes up, don't be afraid to take it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. And uh, if it, you're um, a startup organization or um, a smaller organization, what would you recommend to leaders that CEOs or founders that are looking for individuals like you, how would they go about that? So I, I think, again, it's, it's networking, it's, it's working with recruiters you know, like yourself that have those networks and, and have contacts in the in the industry already. And, and again, just reach out. And, and even if it's somebody that you worked with five, six years ago, they may know somebody that's a good fit. Yeah. Um, and again, that's how you kind of build those connections to find the right individuals. Because honestly, a lot of times the people that tend to apply for roles aren't necessarily the ones that you actually are looking for. Right. right? And, yeah. and you, you need help from professionals to kind of find the top talent sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the same as what you referenced in terms of as a startup. Sometimes you outsource certain things that make a difference, right? It's, it's being willing to say, this is what's going to impact the business in a positive way. And this is where we're going to get the best value for our money. And whether that's what we're recruiters, you hire somebody to help you with HR, help with the, um, uh, the financial functions, with other back office functions. It's all the same. It's finding the right value that you need to build the organization. So, but for top talent and, and the right people, absolutely networking is the key uh, to right. success there. Yeah. And um, fractional as well. I don't know if any of the organizations you work with use fractional talents. So more and more clients are reaching out to us to say, hey, can you help us? We need a uh, fractional. It's yeah. um, growing and we're doing more and more of that where, you know, they don't need a full time CEO, right? Or VP of sales or VP of marketing or just um, yeah. any resource that uh, they need it but they don't need it full time and there are more and more individuals that are near the end of their career that still want to continue to work but don't want to work full time yeah. maybe so or would like to work with two clients as an example so they do fractional yeah. and uh, that's becoming more and more uh, common especially with startups or smaller organizations that 
don't have the financial resources to hire um, full-time people. So that's something as well. I forgot to mention that earlier, but um, are you seeing that as well? So I, I'm seeing it a little bit in the industry. I, I think it depends on the orientations and, and I find it more when you get into private equity and stuff where yeah. again, the, the, the money is kind of driving the focus of how they run organizations as opposed to a, an entrepreneur or founder that is so protective of, okay, well, I got to control everything. I got to have everything, everything in-house, but then they're not willing to spend the money. So they kind of tend to compromise on talent as well. Yeah. Instead of saying, you know what, for what we're willing to spend, we can get the right talent and they bring enough value in the time that they can spend with us and but they forget to focus on the value and it's just about the money coming out of the wallet so i think it's having the mindset of, of looking at what what's going to impact the business in a positive and in a value creation way uh, i think is the key to that and, and i think fractional talent is absolutely a, a great way to go about that as you're starting and until you find your footing and you have that justification to bring people on full time and then hopefully at that point you might already have access to the talent that you need to take it to the next level as well absolutely yeah 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 great well thanks again petter and yeah, uh, thank you linda it's always it's always awesome talking to you so yeah. it's good and uh you know i know our listeners will have appreciated uh, the information you shared and uh you know i uh, appreciate that you have a great rest of the day you too and, linda uh, thank you so much Oh, you're welcome. Okay. You take care. Take, take care.